Welcome to the second Radiographics podcast for the March-April issue of the journal. I'm Wendy Gibbs. Before we start our summaries, a few announcements. The abstract submission site for RSNA 2021 is open. This will be a hybrid virtual and live meeting, so if you're dying to get back to Chicago next winter, here's your chance. I actually am. Also check out the Radiographics website, Cases from the Cookie Jar. Case reports from the files of our new editor, Cookie Minius, written up by members of the Radiographics trainee team. All right, we have a nice variety of topics to discuss today. Opportunistic screening in abdomen CT, a way that we can add value and repurpose data to predict future adverse events for patients. A short summary of congenital anomalies of the upper urinary tract. And from our podcast team chair, Ross Frederick, transposition of the great arteries, an incredibly complex topic that he has made much easier to understand. This will be the first of our core focus summaries. He'll tell us what you need to know on this topic for boards and in the reading room. Okay, our first summary. Opportunistic screening at abdominal CT. Use of automated body composition biomarkers for added cardiometabolic value. Every year we perform 100 million body CTs. We use these to answer a specific clinical question. But what if the imaging data obtained could be utilized for more? repurposed to assess patient risk and prediction of future adverse clinical events, such as the important harmful consequences of osteoporosis, vertebral compression and hip fractures, or metabolic syndrome, or prediction of cardiovascular events. This information can not only be obtained, but assessment can now be fully automated with machine learning algorithms. In this article, the authors describe the individual biometric measures that can be obtained from routine abdomen CT and give examples of the clinical utility these provide. And they propose that in the future, CT could be obtained for dedicated cardiometabolic screening. The group has developed, tested, and validated deep learning and feature-based image processing algorithms, established normative population values, including changes over time, and assessed the ability of the algorithms to predict future adverse events. The examples of cardiometabolic screening opportunities that the authors describe in this paper include assessment of bone mineral density for osteoporosis screening, quantification of aortic calcium for evaluation of cardiovascular risk, quantification of visceral and subcutaneous fat for evaluation of metabolic syndrome, assessment of muscle bulk and density for diagnosis of sarcopenia, and quantification of liver fat for diagnosis of hepatic steatosis. A few of these are more interesting to me than others, and the most important measure they discuss is bone mineral density. Osteoporosis is a vitally important, underappreciated public health concern affecting both men and women, and increasing not only because of the aging population, but because of sedentary lifestyle and unhealthy diet. People don't realize that the risk of osteoporosis is high at a relatively young age, and nearly as common in men who have never been the focus of screening. Half of all men over the age of 50 have low bone mineral density, osteopenia or osteoporosis. The most significant complications are osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures and hip fractures, which result in substantial morbidity and mortality. 30% of patients die within one year of an osteoporotic hip fracture. These devastating fractures result from the most minor of trauma, ground level falls, and in the most osteoporotic fragile individuals, I've even seen sneezing or coughing result in fracture. So the tragedy here is that they are preventable as there are a number of effective medications if we can get the people diagnosed. Despite the consequences, only a minority of older adults are screened, 30% of women and 4% of men. DEXA is the current clinical reference standard for bone mineral density measurements, but it's not an ideal test and yields false negative results in most patients with osteoporotic fractures. CT is better with volumetric capabilities for direct assessment of the vertebral trabecular space, avoiding the overlying cortical bone that a planar study such as DEXA cannot. CT-based assessment of bone mineral density can be performed on studies acquired for other purposes or as an intended examination, which is referred to as quantitative CT or QCT. CT can provide DEXA-equivalent T-scores of the femoral neck as a planar examination, but a faster, more direct, and likely more sensitive approach to opportunistic bone mineral density screening involves placing a region of interest in the anterior trabecular space of the L1 vertebral body. In prior research, the authors have found that L1 trabecular attenuation less than 150 Hounsville units correlates with low bone mineral density, osteopenia or osteoporosis, 
and is approximately 90% sensitive for diagnosis of osteoporosis when they use DEXA as the standard. 90 Hound-Field units appears to be an optimal threshold for determining the risk of osteoporotic fracture. The L1 trabecular measurement can be fully automated, and the authors have used a feature-based image processing algorithm that begins with automated spine segmentation and labeling, followed by isolation of the anterior trabecular space of L1. The automated L1 attenuation value has shown good agreement with data from manual ROI placement. As with manual assessment of the ROI, automated measurement of L1 attenuation values is valuable for identification of patients at risk for future major osteoporotic fractures. In addition, when automated assessment of muscle is included, the diagnostic performance of CT further improves. How about aortic calcium scoring for assessment of cardiovascular disease, the leading cause of death in the U.S. and globally? Accurate assessment of risk for future cardiovascular events helps to guide appropriate patient treatment, including more aggressive treatments for those at highest risk, and protection from the costs and complications related to unnecessary interventions for those at lower risk. And presymptomatic detection of increased risk could lead to important preventative measures, such as initiation of statin therapy. Conventional approaches to cardiovascular risk assessment, such as the Framingham Risk Score, consist of multivariate measures based on traditional clinical risk factors, such as age, sex, cholesterol, blood pressure. However, use of these clinical prediction models tends to place large numbers of patients into an intermediate risk category, requiring additional non-invasive tests. Among these additional tests is CT-based quantification of coronary artery calcification, which is an independent predictor of cardiovascular risk. Atherosclerotic calcification of the abdominal aorta also correlates with coronary artery disease. The authors have found that a single measure of a non-contrast CT-based abdominal aortic calcification score that was acquired with a semi-automated method outperformed the Framingham Risk Score for prediction of future cardiovascular events in a screening cohort. At a threshold Agatson score of 200, and remember that's measure of coronary artery calcification, CT-based quantification of abdominal aortic calcification showed a net improvement of 35% in the accuracy of classification over that of the Framingham Risk Score alone for five-year risk. The authors used a deep learning mask region-based convolutional neural network to automatically segment and quantify the aortic plaque. Similar to the predictive ability shown with the semi-automated approach, the fully automated CT-based aortic calcification scoring algorithm demonstrated better performance than that of the multivariate Framingham Risk Score for both cardiovascular events and overall survival. And as seen with fracture prediction, combining different automated CT-based measures can further improve performance. The authors found further performance improvement in prediction when they combined the measures of CT-based aortic calcification, visceral fat, and liver fat. How about metabolic syndrome? Individuals with metabolic syndrome have a substantially increased risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. The primary goal of identifying individuals with this syndrome is to initiate clinical interventions, especially those centered on weight management, to prevent adverse cardiovascular events and diabetes in the future. This risk is currently assessed with a number of potentially reversible cardiometabolic risk factors in patients with central obesity. Measurable clinical components include elevated triglyceride levels, increased blood pressure, an elevated fasting glucose level, an increased waist circumference or body mass index, and a reduced HDL cholesterol level. We now know that both intra-abdominal or visceral fat and ectopic fat or hepatic steatosis are highly relevant to cardiovascular risk and metabolic syndrome. But these critical measures are not defining criteria, primarily because they cannot be readily obtained through standard clinical, meaning non-imaging, means. Intra-abdominal fat is only indirectly assessed via an elevated BMI or enlarged waist circumference, both of which have shortcomings as surrogates for central obesity. A variety of semi-automated and fully automated tools exist for measurement of both subcutaneous and visceral fat on abdominal CT images. As with the other automated CT-based tools, population-based studies can effectively show sex-related differences in the distribution of subcutaneous and visceral fat. This automated CT tool can also track changes in abdominal fat over time. The authors have previously shown that accounting for the specific distribution of abdominal fat, visceral versus subcutaneous, 
provides much more valuable information than body mass index alone for prediction of future cardiovascular events and death. CT-based fat measures can also be combined with other automated biomarkers to enhance predictive performance. In the interest of time, I won't discuss sarcopenia or quantification of liver fat, but these are also useful measures that can be obtained on abdomen CT with proven screening utility. The ultimate goal for these automated CT biomarkers is to leverage them for actual clinical implementation, which would allow prospective risk profiling in practice. Additional validation in larger and more diverse cohorts is still required, which could be accelerated with use of a federated model. For those of you interested in machine learning, this is training your algorithm across multiple decentralized devices at remote sites, allowing organizations and researchers to collaborate without directly sharing secure data. Repurposing imaging data that are otherwise discarded for the benefit of patients seems like a worthy proposition. The authors conclude by saying that combining multiple CT-based parameters may provide a clear net clinical and economic benefit, supporting the concept of intended or organized CT-based population screening for cardiometabolic risk. Congenital anomalies of the upper urinary tract. I want to give a brief summary of this one. I like to think that as a subspecialist, I can stick with my chosen area of expertise. But in radiology, that is never true. We have to keep up with all the knowledge because different systems are included in all of our imaging exams. So really, there's no such thing as learn it for the boards and forget about it. The upper urinary tract is the most common human system affected by congenital anomalies. These range from simple variants with no clinical significance to complex anomalies that may lead to severe complications and end-stage renal disease. They may be classified as anomalies of renal form, structural or fusion, anomalies of renal position and number, and abnormalities in development of the urinary collecting system. Typically, ultrasound is the first imaging modality used because of its low cost, wide availability, and absence of ionizing radiation. CT urography and MR urography have replaced intravenous urography, allowing us direct visualization of the collecting system, the vascular anatomy, adjacent structures, and complications and functions of the kidneys. Most congenital anomalies of the upper urinary tract are diagnosed in the prenatal and neonatal periods. But detection also occurs frequently in children or adults as either an incidental finding in an asymptomatic patient or as a complication, for example, related to upper urinary tract obstruction or stone formation, infection, hypertension, or renal failure. So this is why we all have to know it. Anomalies of renal form can be structural or related to abnormal fusion. Structural anomalies are anatomic variants related to embryologic defects during the final stages of kidney development including persistent fetal lobulation, a hypertrophied column of Bertin, and a dromedary hump. Fusion anomalies occur during the cranial migration of the kidneys from the pelvis to the lumbar region. The kidneys cross the umbilical arteries, and any change in arterial position may cause fusion of nephrogenic blastema. The fusion may be partial, horseshoe kidney and crossed renal ectopia with fusion, or total, which would be a pancake kidney. Anomalies of renal position also result from migration problems between the fourth and ninth weeks of gestation. These include renal malrotation, simple renal ectopia, and crossed renal ectopia. Anomalies of renal number occur due to defects in the development of the ureteric bud or its interaction with the metanephric blastema at approximately the fifth week of gestation. These anomalies include renal agenesis and supernumerary kidney, which I think is just a fancy word for extra kidney. Anomalies of the urinary collecting system are related to defects in the embryologic development of the ureteric bud starting during the fifth week of development and include pilocalocele diverticulum, megacalyx, ureteral pelvic junction obstruction, duplex collecting system, mega ureter, ectopic ureter, and ureter seal. Wow. Check this one out. The authors deliver on their promise of a very comprehensive review. Okay, this next topic is one I remember trying to study for boards, transposition of the great arteries. This is one tough subject. But fortunately, Dr. Ross Frederick has summarized this article and simplified these difficult concepts. Multimodality imaging of transposition of the great arteries. Transposition of the great arteries is one of the more difficult concepts for a radiologist to learn given the fact that there are two different configurations, the D-type and the L-type, which have completely different physiology. 
Furthermore, there are several reparative surgeries specific to each type, which can have complex imaging findings. This article does an excellent job of breaking down the pathophysiology and surgical options, making it much easier for us to understand. Transposition of the great arteries is a congenital conotruncal abnormality characterized by discordant connections between the ventricles and great arteries, with the aorta originating from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery originating from the left ventricle. This is referred to as arteroventricular discordance. The two main types of TGA are dextroposition of the great arteries, or DTGA, and levotransposition of the great arteries, or LTGA. TGA occurs due to an error in early gestation around six weeks if the normal aortopulmonary spiral septation fails to occur. The choice of imaging modality is dependent on the disease status and local availability of technology and expertise. Echocardiogram is the first-line imaging modality in TGA and can provide information on morphology, function, and hemodynamics. Its limitations include a limited acoustic window, especially in adult patients, and operator dependency. MRI can provide comprehensive information in pre-surgical evaluation, but in children it has only a secondary role to echocardiogram and may require general anesthesia to facilitate the long imaging times and breath holding. MRI is an important modality at post-surgical follow-up of TGA, especially in adults. MRI provides comprehensive information on the anatomy and hemodynamics of cardiovascular structures, baffles, and conduits, as well as quantification of ventricular size and function and valvular function. DTGA is the more common of the two types, with an incidence of about 3 per 10,000 births, and accounts for about 6% of all congenital heart disease making it the second most common congenital heart disease after Tetralogy of Fallot. It results from failure of the spiral movement of the aortopulmonary septum, resulting in a parallel alignment of the aorta and pulmonary artery instead of a normal twisted configuration. In the normal patient, the aorta is located to the right and posterior to the pulmonary artery. However, in DTGA, the aorta is located to the right and anterior to the pulmonary artery. This results in two parallel circulations with impaired oxygenation of peripheral organs, resulting in cyanosis. In the systemic circulation, deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava drain into the right atrium, then right ventricle, then aorta instead of the pulmonary arteries. In the pulmonary circulation, oxygenated blood in the pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium, then left ventricle, and then pulmonary artery instead of the aorta. A helpful hint to keeping the types of TGA straight is to remember that the D in TTGA stands for death, meaning that this circulation is incompatible with life after birth unless there is some communication between the left and right sides, such as an atrial septal defect, patent foramen ovale, ventricular septal defect, or persistent ductus arteriosus. Echocardiogram can reliably diagnose DTGA in the neonatal period. Chest x-ray is not necessary for diagnosis, but is a popular boards question, and when performed, it shows an egg on a string appearance because of the large cardiac silhouette and narrow mediastinum. There is increased pulmonary flow once the ductus arteriosus closes. The differential diagnosis in a newborn with cyanosis and increased pulmonary flow is supercardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return and truncus arteriosus. The most common associated anomaly in DTGA is a ventricular septal defect, seen in 50% of cases. Subpulmonic left ventricular outflow obstruction is seen in about a third of cases, and coronary artery abnormalities are also seen in up to a third of cases and play an important role in long-term prognosis. Surgical correction during infancy is the preferred treatment of DTGA. Definitive surgical procedures include the atrial switch operation, arterial switch operation, and the Rostelli procedures. The atrial switch operation involves redirection of the blood flow at the atrial level through baffles. If you are a simpleton like me and don't know what a baffle is, that's okay. A baffle is an intracardiac pathway that uses the body's own tissue to redirect blood flow and repair of congenital heart disease. The pulmonary venous flow is redirected to the right side of the heart and the systemic venous flow is directed to the left side of the heart. However, this is no longer the preferred technique for treatment of DTGA because despite the procedure, the systemic ventricle remains the morphologic right ventricle, which is ill-equipped to handle systemic afterload in the long term. However, it is frequently encountered in patients undergoing surveillance. I even saw one last week. 
MRI is used to assess for surgical complications, which include baffle stenosis, baffle leak, morphologic right ventricular failure, and right ventricular fibrosis. The arterial switch operation, also known as the Jatine procedure, results in better outcomes than the atrial switch operation. The aorta is transected above the level of the sinuses, and the pulmonary artery is transected before its bifurcation, and the coronary arteries are harvested with a patch of aorta. The distal pulmonary artery is brought anterior to the aorta and anastomosed to the remaining aortic root to form the neopulmonary artery. The distal aorta is anastomosed to the posteriorly located proximal pulmonary artery to form the neoaorta, to which the coronary arteries are reimplanted. One of the main complications is coronary artery stenosis or kinking, owing to the fact that the coronary arteries were reimplanted. Another complication is neoaortic root dilatation, which is a late complication which can result in aortic insufficiency. A third complication is pulmonary artery stenosis, which is usually a branch stenosis rather than a supravalvular stenosis, and can predispose the patient to pulmonary hypertension. Let's switch gears and start talking about LTGA, where there is leftward looping of the primitive heart tube instead of the usual D loop. The simplest way to think of it is that the morphologic right ventricle and left ventricle are simply switched. In LTGA, the aorta is usually located anterior and to the left of the pulmonary artery. In addition to arteroventricular discordance, there is also atrioventricular discordance, meaning the atria are connected to the wrong morphologic ventricle. This double discordance establishes a functional serial circulation, which is why LTGA can be referred to as congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. LTGA is much less common than DTGA, seen in 1 in 13,000, and accounts for less than 1% of all congenital heart disease. Because of physiologically corrected circulation, isolated LTGA is asymptomatic during childhood and is sometimes asymptomatic even until the sixth decade of life. However, most cases of LTGA are associated with other abnormalities, such as ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, and Epstein anomaly. The morphologic right ventricle is not designed to perform the systemic workload over time and will eventually fail. On imaging, it is important to be able to distinguish a morphologic right and left ventricle and is a question that often comes up on board exams. An important feature that helps to distinguish a morphologic left ventricle from right ventricle is the continuity between the atrioventricular and semilunar valves. In a morphologic right ventricle, there is a muscular infundibulum between the atrioventricular and associated semilunar valve, whereas in a morphologic left ventricle, there is a fibrous continuity between these valves. Other features of the morphologic right ventricle include a moderator band, coarse trabeculations, papillary muscles that are attached to both the septum and free wall, rather than just the free wall, and a coarse ventricular septum. If there are no associated lesions, it is debatable whether observation or repair should be offered. If there are associated lesions, either conventional or anatomic repair is recommended. A conventional approach repairs the associated abnormalities without addressing the discordances, and therefore the right ventricle remains as a systemic ventricle with poor long-term outcome. Anatomic repair is performed by either a double switch operation or a sending Rastelli procedure. The double switch operation consists of atrial switch operation and arterial switch operation, usually performed between 7 months and 3 years of age. In anatomic repair, morphologic left ventricle dysfunction can be seen in 10-20% to 20 of cases. Other complications are similar to the individual procedures as discussed previously. And lastly, a note to residents. The best way to solidify your understanding of TGA is to be able to draw out the circuits of both types of TGA. Then modify your diagram based on their respective corrective surgeries in order to understand how they are working. You don't really know it until you can do it from scratch. Wow, fantastic. And so true. Draw it out. That is the best way to learn it. Okay, that's it for this week's podcast. Don't forget to check out these articles on the website. You can also find our previous podcasts and links to related articles. Thanks for listening. Join us in two weeks for the next set of summaries.